I didn't know a lot about the actual life of Jesus before I was in my mid-20s. Honestly, even after I started calling myself a Christian, which is a more interesting conversation now than it's been in the past. But even then, uh, I didn't know a lot about the actual life of Jesus. I had teachings or rumors of sorts, um, you know, accounts and miracles, but like the life, how did he live? What did it look like for him to be a person? Like a person with a neighborhood and family. And like, I didn't know about the life of Jesus. And what actually led me to do the work of discovery and research wasn't a sermon series or anything like that. It was actually seeing a series of books or short documentaries on what people were calling the, quote, lost years of Jesus. So as the four biblical accounts of Jesus have it in his life, uh, we, we can read about his birth, which is actually mostly about his mother's faith and the political environment in which he's born. But then we kind of get nothing till right about when he's 12-ish. When he, the, the story is that he wanders off from his parents and ends up in a conversation with some religious elders. And, and then there's nothing until he's like 30. In fact, <laughs> of the 33-ish years uh, of Jesus' whole human life, what we really get is roughly three years of stories and teachings. That's it. So I started noticing these books in which there was a whole slew of folks who basically gave some imaginative conjecture to, you know, what was Jesus doing as a young adult and into his mid-20s? Like, what what happened during those years be between 12 and 30 or between, you know, birth and 30, etc.? And most of these imaginative creations of the, you know, the, you know, these lost years, there were stories about him, you know, going on a religious pilgrimage. Some folks suggest he studied with the Hindus, some with the Buddhists, others with other groups and tribes. <laughs> and part of it honestly felt like folks trying to make Jesus more like, you know, one of theirs, instead of being challenged by him on his own terms, much the way that nationalists have done so destructively here in the U.S. And that was weird to see, even if it was a bit obvious. It was just kind of weird. But then there was this whole other element to the whole Lost Years narrative that gnawed at me kind of namelessly for a while and I couldn't figure out what it was that bugged me until a lot of years later <laughs> a lot of years of me feeling a kind of distance between the life I was living and any kind of deep cosmic significance even though I was chasing significance all the time my life seemed boring so here's what bugged me and I get it now, is it, why was it necessary? Why is it necessary? Why would it be necessary that in order to be a wise, spiritually insightful person, Jesus had to leave home and go be hyper-religious somewhere? What was his fascination with this exotic religious experience? And more to the point, what was wrong with the ground beneath his feet? What was missing from the dirt underneath his feet that would require him leaving in order to discover goodness, truth, beauty, holiness, resonance, light that he would then bring back to the boring existence that he was living in. In other words, these stories reinforce the same garbage sales pitch that every other bad religious marketing scheme was rooted in. You are not enough. Your life is not significant as it is. You need us. The warm glow of divine connection exists somewhere on the other side of all this mundane, nearly worthless stuff you're doing, like school and dating and working and looking for more work or new work or paying rent with the money you make from work and money itself and talking through troubles in your key friendships or enjoying jokes or wiping your kids butts and fixing leaky, leaky faucets and on and on. Like God is real, but God does not happily live where you live and certainly not in you and your boring, boring life. That was the narrative. So here's what I've come to. A religious narrative, a, relig a religious story or a religious product that doesn't set the world around you and within you aglow with meaning and energy and hope and potential is absolute and utter trash and is entirely undeserving of your time and your attention. If you leave your religious gathering and your home seems darker because it doesn't feel as good as the show that that team of well-funded professionals put on, you aren't being discipled, you're being swindled. Because if the incarnation story of Jesus says anything clearly, and I think it does, it announces in no uncertain terms that God was pleased to live as a human being and to do so in such a way 
that for nearly 30 years, that life, his life, looked so much like yours and mine that we didn't even notice it. It says that it's not just okay to be human and have a job and a neighborhood and a family and friends and to sleep and snack and make love and fight and forget and remember and work and rest and learn. It's sacred to be human. It says that you don't have to go looking for significance. You are significant. It says that you don't have to go on a pilgrimage to find holy ground. You're standing on it now. And the point of a true pilgrimage is to come home and see the place you live in more completely, more aglow with significance. Part of what I think you hear in my conversation with Kyla Craig is the way her integrated life gleans energy and insight from its various dimensions, parenting and neighboring and writing and so on. Not disparate elements to be handled one at a time lest they detract from or lessen or even corrupt one another, but a living network of relationships beautifully entangled up in Kyla's own joy and desire. Some of my guests are people who are doing remarkable work that I want you to know about. Some of my guests are doing that remarkable work in a way that I find deeply challenging and informative. I would like to do both. And I think you might want that as well. So that as you look around your life, Look through your own psychology, your own relationships, and look at the ground beneath your own feet. You see it glowing with divine fingerprints and hope and potential and light.